Hi, you're tuned in to Broken Meeple News, and now off to Ollie Williams with the Petrical Weather Forecast. Ollie? It's raining sideways! Sounds rough, Ollie. Do you have an umbrella? Had one! Where is it? Inside out, two miles away! Is there anything we can get for you? Bring me some soup! What kind? Chunky! Hi everyone, welcome to another Broken Meeple review. Today, I'm actually quite eager to talk about this one because I always wanted to see not only innovation, but different themes represented in games because I'm getting tired of the same old stuff repeated on and on and on. You know, we get Viking this, we get zombie that, we get dungeon crawl this, you know, we get trading in the med that, you know, I want more interesting themes. And one game I remember last year in particular, you know, remember who remembers Photosynthesis? It was out last year, it was a great little abstract game, and it was like growing trees in this little forest and you had to grow trees at different heights in order to get points. It was really good, but it was really unique. You know, no other game had tried it. Today, it's another kind of similar thing to that. I'm looking at Petrichor. Petrichor, the, what do they call it? The pleasant earthly smell after rain. You know, there you go, the more you know. Petrichor takes on a really unique thematic aspect by having you all play essentially as clouds. You are trying to drop rain of your own colour onto various tiles which represent crops. As the crops bloom, players get points depending on who controls the most raindrops on a particular tile. And the idea is, is that it's a communal set of tiles, but each player will have clouds that you know can be controlled by players depending on the majority and you have these little glass beads that you put inside the clouds and by playing action cards each round you move these clouds across the map you put more raindrops in you turn them into thunder clouds you drop all the raindrops onto particular tiles and effectively you are positioning yourself over these tiles in such a way that you're going to land your raindrops where you want them and score points that's half the game the other half represents a voting board where as you're playing these action cards, not only are you triggering off special effects based on the type of weather on the card, so say frost, sun, wind for example, you are also placing counters on this little voting board where it's dependent on which cards you play. At the end of a round, the, mo the, the two sort of weather effects with the most voting tokens on them trigger off and then even more effects start happening, but on a more sort of global scale. Whereas the cards individually were just you yourself doing them, these ones more affect pretty much everybody on the table. And this sort of repeats from round to round until eventually you reach the end, you score up with many tracks, you know, you know, who got the best on the voting board, who got the most points from the crops, etc. And, hmm, have a guess. Winner with the most victory points. Of course! In terms of the component quality in that, it's pretty tap notch. You know, I like the box with this whole sort of sleek na white nature, as well as this cool teardrop in the middle, but the components themselves are really solid. I mean, you've got different colored glass beads for the raindrops, they feel good, they're, you know, they're nice and big, they're not titchy and tiny. I wish maybe the same sort of thing or something similar was used for the voting tokens. They are literally just little like wooden discs and very tiny ones at that. I wish that could have been something different because they get a little bit unwieldy, but yeah, it's a minor little nitpick. But the scoring board is great. You know, you've got the circular score tracks. You've got the voting board track where you can score points at the end of the game. And it's cool that you can see these little weather effects dotted all over the board. You think that there's one in particular. It looks like earth leaves and a bit of dirt, you know, like what you see in autumn, for example. And the amount of times I've seen people think that I've spilt something on my board because that little touch is there. It's just, it's a nice little touch. It's a nice little design perk. The clouds themselves, they're little fold-up clouds. You put them on little standees and you move them over the tiles. The beads sit nicely in them like a little cradle. And then you just tip them out when you need to, or you put this tiny little lightning bolt on the side to represent it being a thunder cloud. The artwork is just pretty solid as well. You know, everything's beautiful looking, everything's nice and colorful, you know, without being too busy. Nothing in this game feels busy. You can see where the tiles are. It's clearly printed on each tile what they do when the crop blooms or when it's not bloomed, because you have to obviously water crops in order to get them to grow. But it's clear. The graphic design is very good. You can look at a tile and instinctively think, 
oh yeah, if I'm there, I get that many points, second gets that many points, and if I'm there, depending on how many players you've got, there's that many points. It's fairly intuitive and fairly self-explanatory. There's only so much explaining you have to do, and that is a good point. On top of these components, you know, the rule book itself is pretty decent as well. Fairly big size, everything is laid out nice and clearly. I didn't have any trouble learning it from this rule book. You've got a lot of picture diagrams. It's, uh, you know, pretty colorful, pretty easily, you know, pretty well laid out. I was happy with it. You know, I, I, I was afraid that the rule book was gonna be a little bit unclear when I saw it this big, but you know, no, it's mostly pictures. There's certainly, this isn't what I would call a pick up and play game, but you know, you should be able to be done and dusted within a short space of time when you're learning the game from scratch. The game itself is actually relatively easy to grasp. You know, I may not be explaining it that well, but the rules to this are not particularly complex. You essentially play cards from your hand to trigger actions. And whether you play one card or play two cards in order to, like, you know, because you've got to play them in suits, or try and play three cards in order to do multiple things on a turn is up to you but predominantly it's just play these different suited cards. You know, there's no text on the cards as such, it's just the symbols. And then as well as doing that, these cards also place the tokens on the voting board. So as you're playing each one, you have to kind of figure out, right, um, I need to do this on this board, but it's also gonna affect that. Is that what I want? Or shall I play this card just so I can have what I need on the voting board, even though it doesn't help me here and vice versa? So there's definitely a lot of hand card management. But at the end of the day, the crux is all about the area control. You are trying to get all those raindrops onto the various tiles in such a way that it scores you more points than your opponent. And certainly, if you don't like mean games, you might want to stay away from this one. This has a nice cutesy theme. It sounds very nice, doesn't it? Very earthy and pleasant. You know, oh, you're a little rain cloud, you're dropping little raindrops everywhere. Yeah, believe me, you can get angry in this game. I've seen it happen. It's not that you're, sometimes you're not necessarily deliberately doing it, although sometimes you are, but bear in mind, all of you are fighting over these tiles. You're all trying to get your raindrops around. And as you move clouds together, they merge into thunder clouds and all the raindrops sort of combine together and people can move your clouds around. You know, you don't have like, always have full control over your own cloud and tiles may, you know, there's, there's all sorts of ways that the opponents can screw you over. And certainly with four players, there's plenty of screwage in this game. Personally, I think the sweet spot's more with three players. It certainly makes a very good two player, but even four player is actually good fun. Just know that the more players means the more mean it is. But that's not to say that two players isn't particularly mean either. So you better be comfortable with a little element of take that before you step into Petrogol. The book says, 20 minutes a player now yeah that's that's not too bad actually that's that's fa fairly accurate a four player game should at most last you about an hour and a half and depending on ap players and i will say this with a caveat ap players probably should stay away from this as well because i have had times where somebody will be staring at those tiles for ages thinking if i play this i can do this and do that and they will freeze up there shouldn't be any reason really. There's only so many cards in your hand. You don't have like this gigantic hand size and you can only do so much. So you shouldn't be able to try and plan too far ahead, even though you do have to kind of set yourself up in places. But yeah, AP players can slow it down a little bit, but generally a four player game shouldn't last more than 90 minutes and that's about right. Any longer than that and I'd be saying, yeah, this outstays its welcome. And I suppose even 90 minutes, it's reaching that borderline. It kind of depends on how quick the turns have been during that time. But two or three players, you can get this done in about an hour, an hour and a quarter tops. Decent length for what is not necessarily a light game, but certainly touch between light and medium, I guess. I mean, the, the rules are not that complex, but the depth is quite, is quite, is there. There's certainly plenty to think about. You're planning turns, you're looking at where the clouds are, where the raindrops are, trying to figure out who's got the majority. What could that player be up to? Can they beat me if I decide to go over to the coffee crop, for example? And then you're looking at the voting board as well, you know, over to the side where, right, uh, I want the, the wind effect to trigger off this round. That means I'm gonna have to play wind cards. I need my tokens on there, gets me point. There's a fair amount to think about. It's deceptively clever. And I gotta give it props for that. Granted, I mean, it's not a brain burner as such. 
And there are one or two slightly unintuitive matters like uh, the dice in the middle of the voting board that you you kind of, if you want to score a random point, you just turn it to a different face and when they get to harvest faces, the round ends, it's, that's kind of weird and having just that little point is a bit odd, but you know, minor nitpicks, it's just, like I say, it's a design choice and it does mean that the round doesn't necessarily finish when you think it will because the players have the choice over what to do with the dice. So, you know, eventually the round will end but not necessarily after, say, four turns or six turns or eight turns. It's not fixed. And that's a good thing. I like it when rounds don't have a certain timer. You know, like, you know, it's going to end after this many actions, done. It's all well and good, but I like it when it's more varied than that. And finally, the game does also provide a solo mode. This is effectively a deck of cards that determines certain abilities and things that go off. But you are effectively, you know, you're there with the tiles and the clouds and you're trying to get the most points that you can by doing what essentially you do in a multiplayer game. Except that that little deck of cards can throw a little spanner in the works as they call it the sudden winds. It's a neat little solo mode, doesn't take particularly long, you know, I've played better solo modes, but this one is still pretty good, you know, if if you want to learn the rules to this game, there are some changes between this and multiplayer, but you should be able to at least get the gist. Failing that, it doesn't take that long to play the solo game, probably about less than 30 minutes, I would say, so if you want something uh, that looks pretty, but maybe is a little bit more involved on the brain, but doesn't take too long, then certainly worth a try as well. And then finally, just to mention quickly, you can also get this Petrichor Flowers expansion, which is effectively a little mini expansion for the game. All the contents from this fit inside here, so I will no longer need this when I'm done with this video. But, you know, essentially it's, it is mini. You know, there's not a lot to it. It's fairly cheap to get. And to be honest, I'm surprised it wasn't in the base game to begin with. But, you know, I digress. And essentially all this adds is, for starters, adds the ability to have a fifth player. Yeah, chuck that out of the window immediately. Ain't nobody got time for that. Seriously, I do not want fifth players in this. A game is long enough with four, five just extends it. Not, don't want, don't want five players. No, 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 no. However, thankfully that's a small part. It's nice to have another player color, I guess. That's about it. If you like white beads, then there you go, you can get this. The main things that this one does add though, apart from that little fifth player thing, is having three new flower tiles, which are essentially like crops, but they're a bit more complex than the ones in the base game. I don't recommend using them to start off teaching players. I say you just use the base game ones to begin with, but then you can just mix them with, you know, mix them in there and it works pretty well, which is chops and changes the game a little bit from time to time. The two main things that I really do like from this mini expansion though, firstly, player powers. Each player can now have a player power that makes them different from everybody else. It gives them a perk at certain times when certain cards are played. That, yeah, throw that into every game. You know, otherwise you are exactly the same and that's a little bit dull. You want to have some differentiation, some little perk. They seem fairly well balanced, but you know, I haven't had enough games to really comment on the, the statistics of the balance. But you know, it's good to have them. I want to use them in every game, therefore they go in every game. They're not difficult to teach and you can just literally deal one out at random. And then finally, you've got forecast cards. These are effectively a bit like events or interrupt cards from any other game. And they essentially give you some special ability that you can use at a particular time. Some of them are played on your turn. Some of them have a specific timeline spot that tells you when you're allowed to play it. So like during voting or during the cloud movement or during harvest, that kind of thing. But these are cool, you know, they do add a bit more complexity, however, because the icons on them are not 100% intuitive. There's an index at the back with pictures, so you can find out easily what each one does. The problem is, is that most of the time you will need to consult that book to find out what they do. And that's a little bit of a giveaway, because the cards in your hand are secret. So, you know, when you've got these cards, they don't necessarily count towards you know, your hand size, but then it's like, hmm, hang on a minute. Uh, let me just grab the book and let me just uh, have a little check here, see, and it's a, it's a bit of a giveaway that you've got a forecast card and you've got to constantly be picking this up to have a look at the abilities. It would have been nice maybe if the cards just, you know, had a little bit of extra sort of information on them, but you know, the iconography is not bad. It's just not 100% intuitive, particularly to new players. So I still don't recommend using the forecast cards out of the box unless you feel people want you know the whole shebang and they want to handle it. So this is kind of a take it or leave it thing. I like the forecast cards, they're cool, but they are more complex. 
I love the player powers, they go in every game full stop. And the flower tiles, mix and match, they're not too bad. I mean, there's only three of them. So even if they are a bit more complex, it doesn't take much to explain each one. So you could throw them into every game as well. So this is very much a, if you need, if you feel like you want it, then get it. You know, but it's cheap enough and everything fits in here. The insert is designed to hold everything, even although I might recommend you keep the like the punch boards or something, just to layer on the top, just to ensure that everything stays in there, particularly when you uh, store it vertically like I do. So Petrogore overall is a decent area control game. Fairly mean, doesn't outstay its welcome, but reaches that little top spot with four players. Adds enough variety to keep it fresh from time to time. It's gonna need more than just three more tiles and some player powers in order to keep it going for say, the long, long term. But, you know, the map is different each game in terms of its layout and, you know, different players will play in different fashions. So there's multiple ways you can play, you know, focus on the clouds, focus on the voting board, a bit of everything. And it's just generally a good fun game with a very unique theme. You know, it's not one that I'm going to pull out like all the time. You know, certainly I think it suits more, you know, suits more with two or three players. So that's kind of like the player count I want to play it with. Four players is fine, but just that essence a little bit too mean for my liking but all in all i think petrogore is a solid game probably personally about a seven for me it's still one that i'd like to hang on to though because i like games with unique themes and i think this will appeal to a lot of people when i show them the game definitely not gateway level somewhere in the heavy no not heavy you know the light medium i'd say more medium weight for this one and it's just a solid game all around nothing spectacular but i can't really think of anything particularly bad about it either it, does what it wants to do, and does it pretty well. So that's Petricor. I'll see you on the next review where I'll talk about Empires of the Void 2. Hope you look forward to that one. See you next time. If you like what you see, subscribe to the channel, find me on Facebook and Twitter. Check out my other content like top 10s and my playthroughs of board game apps. Until then, even if it's a rainy day, this is just only a game, so uh, have fun. See you next time. Take care. Go Ray!